morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in uh, to the Repton Worship Service. I'm, I'm excited for today, Joey. Yeah? Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have fun. I'm, I'm telling you, today is going to be fun. Why is that? Well, we got the we got the children's message, which I actually enjoy, by the way. Uh, even though I'm not a child, maybe I'm a child at heart, but <laughs> I enjoy them. Uh, and I get to talk about one of the most complicated passages in all of Scripture. That's why I was glad he was preaching on it and not me. <laughs> Well, yeah, so anyway, um, you know, you might want to go find yourself a notebook because uh, we're going to get into it. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be good. I'm, I'm excited for it, um, you know, but I'm really just going to drill down on the main. Keep the main things the main thing, because uh, if you noticed today, our scripture passage is very long. So. We have a few announcements before we get into our service. Uh, we wanted to bring to your attention an email that was sent out uh, prior to this service, and it contains a survey. We really just want to hear from you, um, you know, our Refton people, your feelings on on uh, really just reconvening as a large group. Um, we have a plan. We presented that plan, you know, several weeks ago. We're sticking with that plan. I mean, it might be a little fluid uh, as we as we progress from week to week, just because we have to. Um, but we still want to hear from you uh, because as we grow nearer to the green phase um, or whatever that entails, um, we we as leaders want to know how you're feeling about it, your comfort level. That will really help us. Uh, as we uh, just make decisions moving forward. Um, so that email is from SurveyMonkey and it is called, I think it's called Moving Forward for Refton. Uh, so I encourage you to fill that out as soon as possible. Um, you know, even by midweek uh, Wednesday would be very helpful for us. Uh, also, if you're not on our email list and you know maybe you're new to Refton Church and you would like to get updates, we, we send out a weekly email update. Uh, if you would like to be on that list, uh, Joey's going to put up on the screen right here, whoop, office at reftonchurch.org. If you email us, we'll put you on that list uh, and then you'll be getting those updates from week to week. Going along with that, now that we're in our yellow phase, it's bringing about uh, the continuance of some of our ministries here at Rafton, such as Refit. So ladies, that's been happening. Uh, you can check out our website for more details, but it's just really encouraging to start to see Rafton come alive again with the different ministries. Going along with that is also RSM. Uh, we're going to continue meeting in person, Lord willing. Uh, this coming week, this Wednesday, we're going to try and do a campfire again. It was a little bit too windy th uh, this past Wednesday, so hopefully this time it'll work. Yeah, but, that, that's a good note. Actually, uh, both Refit and RSM met outside yeah, and yeah. continue to plan to do that to my, to my knowledge. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're really, really excited to meet again together and just continue our ministries uh, within the yellow stage here at Refton. So. Yeah, and you know, we just want to continue to thank you for supporting us here at Refton. Uh, thank you for your offerings, for your faithfulness in that so we can continue to do what we do uh, and be the church. Um, you know, if, if you're new to that, uh, if you don't know how to uh, send in an offering, you can go to our website, reftonchurch.org. There's a tab up at the top there where you can do online giving. Uh, and it's pretty, it's pretty simple that way. We always appreciate anything that you decide to give. Uh, those of us that are members and maybe you have an envelope, uh, just remember, just wanted to remind you, uh, you can send those in just through the mail uh, with a regular stamp and, and that works as well if you're comfortable with that. Um, so yeah, it's at this time, uh, we're going to dive into the children's message. So here we go. Hey everyone, I'm Marshall. And I'm Joanne. And today we're going to chat about mentors and how we can grow by being mentored. Absolutely. And people normally think that you have to be older than someone to be a mentor. That's not always true. Being a mentor just means you have more experience than the other person in a certain area. Joanne, 
Have you ever been mentored by someone younger than you? I have been. These last two years, I have been a youth leader, something I have never done before in the past, and I'm completely out of my element, and I've learned so much over these last two years, and that mentor, my friend, is you. Man, it's so cool, Joanne, to hear that. That me pouring into you just translates to you pouring into other people. It just shows, though, that walking alongside someone through life through the ups and downs is better than pointing at someone and telling them how to live during that time. That sounds like such great advice. Let's check out today's God story. Why was the math book sad? Because it had so many problems. Hi friends, it's Jen, and I'm so glad to be back with you today. I want to share a story with you about a spiritual mentor that I've had in my life. Now, first of all, what is a spiritual mentor? It's basically someone that helps you get to know Jesus more and more. So my spiritual mentor is someone named Leanne. Hello. She was my youth pastor when I was a kid, and she really helped me get to know Jesus more and more by asking me a lot of questions, by leading me through Bible study, and even taking me on a missions trip where I got to see Jesus at work in another country. I wanted to share this with you today because today's big idea is spiritual mentors help us know God better. I think we all need to have spiritual mentors in our lives. And in fact, the writer of Hebrews thinks so too. So in this series specifically, we are looking at Hebrews chapter 12. And first we talked about how following Jesus is like running a long distance race. And last time we talked about how God can use difficulties to make us stronger. So today we're going to pick up in chapter 12, verse nine. Let's check it out. Besides, we have all had human fathers who trained us. We respected them for it. How much more should we be trained by the Father of spirits and live? Our parents trained us for a little while. They did what they thought was best. But God trains us for our good. He does this so we may share in His holiness. No training seems pleasant at the time. In fact, it seems painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of godliness and peace. It does this for those who have been trained by it. Okay, I really like this part. We all have someone in our lives, whether it's a parent, a sibling, a teacher, a coach, someone who takes care of us and helps to train us. And while we might not always like that we don't get our own way, we can respect and love them for helping us in the growing up process. Well, if that's the case with human friends and family members, how much more true is it of the God of heaven who loves us? The verse goes on to say that our parents trained us for a little while. Your parents are still training you, and they are doing what they think is the very best for you. But as God trains us, He trains us in the most complete ways so that we can become more like Jesus. One of the ways God trains or corrects us is by placing spiritual mentors or leaders in our lives. Remember, spiritual mentors help us know God better. You see, these spiritual mentors aren't trying to make you a better person or more like themselves. They are trying to disciple you to become more like Jesus. In verse 11, it says that no training feels pleasant at the time. In fact, it can feel painful. Think about it this way. Remember when we talked about how following Jesus is like running a long distance race? Well, when you're training to run a race, I have heard that it can be quite painful. And even when you're running, your muscles can hurt, your feet can get sore, you can get really thirsty and tired, but it's all worth it when you cross that finish line and have the satisfaction of finishing that race. It's the same thing in our spiritual race and being trained by God. Sometimes it can be painful. Maybe we confess something to someone that we've done and maybe we're really embarrassed or sad by it. But then you can let it go, know God's forgiveness and receive the peace that he brings. Through these things, God moves us closer to him and our spiritual mentors and leaders are there to help us move closer to God. And as we hang out with them and train with them, spiritual mentors help us know God better. Well, it was so great hanging out with you again today. I will see you next time. Quick, turn to the person next to you and answer the following questions. Man. <laughs> Question time! What is a spiritual mentor? Someone who helps you see spirits? Someone who helps you with your homework? Or someone who helps you know God better? Who is a spiritual mentor in your life? Photo. 
How many times can you say the key verse before the photo is taken? Say it with me. My child, think of the Lord's training as important. Do not lose hope when He corrects you. The Lord trains the one He loves. He corrects everyone He accepts as His child. Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6. Get ready! 3, 2, 1, go! Wow, so we've just learned that God can teach us through spiritual mentors. So I encourage you when you're back at church, find someone that can mentor you or point you in the direction of someone that can mentor you and walk alongside you in life. That in itself, Marshall, is such great advice. So we're gonna head back to Kenya and visit Transcend Running Academy. We're gonna talk to a few athletes who have some mentors in their life that coach them and encourage them to be amazing athletes. Let's check it out. All right, we just finished our workout and we're back here. Uh, we're about to have some chai tea with the, the rest of the athletes and we're going to meet a few and find out a little bit more what life is like here at the academy. And we see those people running, they are famous, they are well famous people and they well the people so that is only what to make us to run. They get a lot of motivation from from the people who have made it and are successful and have come from Kenya because it gives them hope. It makes them realize that hey if this person who grew up where I grew up in this village in Kenya or in this tribe in Kenya made it and is successful, I can do that too. I know that a lot of them have been mentored by a coach or neighbor. If you wanted to run now, I'll give you all the facilities. Hmm. And anything you, you want, anything which will be difficult, I'll be there to assist you. So he really motivated me and told me that work hard in school as well as running. One girl, uh, her older sister is a world champion and so her sister really encouraged her to work really hard. She told me that I should run so that I'll be like her. Uh... I would like to be a top town in future. I want to be a lawyer in future. I would like to be an engineer. Engineer, that's what she wants me to too. be. <laughs> Lee and I are in Western Kenya on our way to visit a small training academy that is trying to help a group of youth develop their extraordinary natural ability and give them a chance at becoming world champions. We want to find out what is giving these youth from rural Africa a chance to succeed and see what we can learn from their training. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. After learning more about some of the runners, we got to go and visit some of their homes where they lived. The first place we stopped was Edward's home. So he actually lives here, on top of this beautiful, beautiful mountain. He's one of 10 kids, and he never had any formal training in running. One of his teachers noticed that he was a great runner, and so the teacher pushed him and trained him and coached him so he could be the best runner he could be. And now he's a really successful runner. With money he got from winning a race uh, last year, he was able to plant 350 trees at home. This one. This ones? Yeah. Oh, you planted them? Yeah, I planted them last year. So you spent your money on trees? Yeah. Oh my wow. goodness. And then used the rest of the money to plant corn and things for his family. So it's benefiting his whole family, not just him. The most amazing thing about visiting Edward's home was seeing the field that he trains in. It was literally just a lumpy field for the cattle, and he said that he would run around the field while looking after the cows for training. On the demonstration. So he's just an amazing person. He's so young and so humble and so talented. Next, we went to visit Bengulio's home, which was also way up in the hills. And he told us that he would run to and from 
the running training camp that they were doing every single day. How long does that take you? Oh yeah, about uh, two hours. Oh my one hour. goodness. It was really cool because as soon as we got into his room, he had these posters on the wall that he says it's motivation for him. Every day when I walk, I pray good and then I normally see so that it reflects my, my dreams. Those guys are running and why not me? And he showed us a pair of running shoes that he'd been running in for two years and they had holes completely worn through the bottom. And lastly, we got to visit Felix's home. Welcome. Thank you. Mm, welcome. Nice to meet you. He started running when he was in grade eight, and he has a mentor who's a famous runner from Uganda. He actually built a house just over in the hills there. Do you run together? Yeah, we should run together. That's awesome. I'm very proud now because I'm training with champion. Mm. Now I've joined an academy down there, yeah. so I'll do very best. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. He saw the house that this guy was building, and that was one of the things that he said he wanted to get was a nice house like that. It seems like a common theme for all of them. They just want to have a better quality of life. They want to have a decent home to live in and sort of rise above poverty where a lot of them have been living. And he said that he runs these every day, these hills here. We tried to race Felix up it and a few of the other runners. Lee actually was impressive. She did very well. We also had like a 20 meter head start. From hearing stories from these athletes, I think it's clear to see how important it is to have a role model and to have someone encouraging you, especially in Bengulio's story. Uh, he was telling us that he didn't even really want to run, but his friends pushed him into a race, and so he did it. And ever since then, he's been pushing himself and he's kept working hard. And without people pushing and encouraging him, he would never be the runner that he is today, and he wouldn't have the opportunity he is now to be a world-class runner. Question time! What stood out to you about the runner's stories? What inspired the runners to keep running? That was great. I love how these different mentors are helping these athletes, from a teacher, a sister who's a world champion, another world champion from Uganda who's not even related to them at all. Absolutely, but hearing the youth talk about their mentor, you can see how inspired they are by them. And that brings us back to where each of us are in our relationship with God. Even if we are close to God, a mentor can share their knowledge and experience and help us grow even closer to Jesus. Absolutely. So we're going to break off into our small groups and see what this looks like in our own lives. See ya.
sin that we might be called his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Hebrews, starting at chapter 6, verse 13, and going all the way till chapter 7, verse 28. Scott, that's a really long passage to be reading from. That is a long passage, Joey. I have an idea. <laughs> Why don't you take some time, pause the video, read it for yourself, or read it with your family. I just think that would be great. Uh, read down through it. Uh, because 
when you do, it'll make a lot more sense uh, when we actually uh, do the sermon. So go for it. So last week, Joey did a great job talking about salvation. Now, if you remember, salvation is just a theological term that talks about a person who is being saved from the wrath of God. Now, we're going to get into that even more toward the end of this sermon. Uh, but for now, I really just want to revisit that question that Joey was just hammering home uh, last week. Can someone lose their salvation? Now, uh, he did a great job, and I, and I completely agree with everything he said, so I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Uh, I'm only reiterating what he's saying because what we're going to talk about today flows directly out of the passage that he dealt with as well. So I just don't want you to think of it like two separate things. Um, but yeah, so the question was, can someone lose their salvation? Well, like Joey said last week, absolutely not. Uh, it's impossible for a believer to lose their salvation because salvation is a gift from God. You can't lose a gift that God gives you. However, and here's the key, you can reject that gift. Okay, so I think of uh, I think of Josh Harris. Joshua Harris uh, was a former pastor, and he was a, a Christian author who last year uh, went out to the public and, and just said that he no he's no longer a Christian. So, you know, he's like, whatever that word means to you, I am no longer a Christian. Um, and uh, you might remember that I actually talked about that event uh, back in our First Timothy series in November. Well, I, I mean, simply put, Josh no longer believes in the gospel. And, and for me, this is, uh, you know, it has a, a bit of a personal um, sorrow to it. I mean, there ought to, we ought to be, we ought to weep when anybody rejects the gospel. But, uh, you know, I, I, I was impacted by his books, you know, the, the I Kiss Dating Goodbye and uh, his second one, which was, uh, what was that? Boy Meets Girl. There it is. You know, uh, as an 18-year-old teenager, um, those books, while while I may not have been, you know, theologically in the know or whatever, but those books helped me where I was in my relationship with Jesus and really impacted me. So it just saddens me to, to hear when anyone uh, like that just, you know, walks away from God. But here's the thing. This is, this is why I'm bringing this up. At one point in Josh's life, he accepted Jesus into his life. He put his faith in Jesus. Josh got the gift of eternal life, okay? But now that he doesn't believe anymore, did, does that mean he lost his salvation? Well, he never could lose his salvation while he was a believer. But now that he rejects the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that means he's rejecting the gift of salvation. You see the difference there? He didn't lose the gift. He's rejecting it. And, and I'm not here to pick on Josh, really. Uh, I just think that he's a, a good example because he's, he's one that is rejecting the gospel publicly. Um, so, you know, uh, I know many of you uh, were also impacted by his books, and I would encourage you to, to pray for him uh, because I believe even though he rejected it, as we've seen time and time again in Hebrews now, uh, God's promise still stands. So if Josh were ever to come back to Jesus, to faith in Jesus, he would have that gift of eternal life, of salvation. So the point here is, you know, like Joey was saying last week, a believer cannot lose their salvation. That's impossible. Their eternal destiny is secure because of their loyalty to Jesus, who, by the way, is our high priest. We've been talking a lot about that lately. But what about what Joey was talking about last week, that, that phrase, you know, once saved, always saved. I mean, if you've been in, in a church 
uh, for you know a long period of time, chances are you've probably heard that phrase: "Once saved, always saved." It's just a it's a it's a phrase that describes our theological views of what we're reading in the Bible about salvation. Once once you're saved, you're always saved. So uh, that's true of the believer who doesn't reject Jesus and his gospel message. Because look, here's the truth. If someone is rejecting Jesus, if someone's rejecting his gospel message, that simply means like if someone rejects that Jesus is fully God and fully man, if you reject that Jesus died for your sins, if you reject your own inability to be good enough for God, if you reject the fact that Jesus is the only way to God and that he is God, if someone rejects any of that or even all of that, then that person does not have the gift of eternal life. They do not have the gift of salvation because to reject the gospel message is to reject the gift of eternal life with God. But if you believe, if you believe the message of Jesus, if you were only loyal to him, then yes, you were once saved at that initial moment of belief and you continue to be saved uh, because you are always saved so long as you remain a believer. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 through 20. Now, we're going to fly through this, but the main idea here is that God's promise of eternal life is clear, it's unchanging, and it's confirmed with an oath. So those of us who believe in Jesus can be confident that our promised eternal life with God is a certainty. It is a fact. We will enter into God's rest. And the writer says in verse 19 that the hope we have, that assurance, biblical assurance that we have in God's promise, it's like an anchor for the soul. You know, I was just at the beach uh, last week and I can easily just picture a boat uh, just being rocked back and forth by stormy uh, weather, you know, by the waves and the wind and the, the gusts of, you know, and the, and the rain beating down on it. Um, you know, the boat, think of the boat as like, it's like our soul. And the storm is like uh, just everything in the world that seeks to just throw us off the course of, of our faith in Jesus. Everything that would want to pull us away from our faith in Jesus. But this is saying, you know, the our hope, our assurance that we have in Christ uh, of our salvation, it's like an anchor that just is planted in the depths of the ocean, that's connected to us, and that is firm, it is secure, it is not moving, it is unchanging. Why? Well, so that we don't make a shipwreck of our faith. Our anchor is firm and secure. Praise God! that is firm and secure. You know, because there are people out there walking around that don't know this. This is milk, by the way, but they don't they don't know this. Uh, they're, they're walking around thinking, well, I hope I live a good enough life. We don't, we don't need that kind of a hope. We have an assurance kind of a hope. It's a certainty. This is a, that's actually a theme that's going to be repeated more and more as we go throughout Hebrews. We can be certain of our eternal security because we have a high priest, because we have a high priest who actually went behind the curtain on our behalf. Now, remember, we, we learned in previous sermons in this series that going behind the curtain, is, it's just like uh, it's just like being able to approach God. It's, it's approaching God. And Jesus approached God on our behalf, and he became our high priest. Now, that means that he's our go-between. He's now our mediator between us and God. And interestingly, uh, Scripture says that Jesus became our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. 
And that brings us to chapter seven. Chapter seven, Joey. Joey loves chapter seven. Uh, this was a chapter that he just wanted so desperately to avoid teaching and preaching. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's, I, I asked him why, and he's like, because I just want to learn from you. I'm like, yeah, okay, um, great. Well, why would Joey want to avoid it? Well, it's because it's really difficult. Uh, it may not come off as difficult to us at first glance, but uh, Bible scholars say that the topic of Melchizedek is the most difficult and complex topic in all of Scripture. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, so, you know, there are many rabbit trails that I could go down. And to be honest, most of them only lead to more questions. But, uh, you know, I, if, you, if, if you're getting to know me, you know that I love to go deep. Um, I love to get in there in the weeds and, and really just pull, uh, pull out some, some biblical truth for sure. Uh, but I kind of want to avoid just an information dump because that's really what this would turn into today. I want to avoid that information dump. I think it would be uh, just wise uh, to just focus on the writer's main idea for chapter seven. So that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, I, that means I'm actually not going to go down through chapter seven verse by verse to just kind of explain everything that's there. I'm just I'm just going to give you a general idea uh, and really uh, so that you know not only what's going on, but why does this why does this matter to me today? Okay, so I want you to have your Bibles open, uh, even though we have it up there on the screen. Um, I want to start by looking at chapter seven, uh, and we're going to look at the chunk of verses one to verse ten. All right. So the writer of Hebrews is referencing an Old Testament story from from Genesis chapter fourteen where Abraham defeats uh, some enemies and he goes in and he rescues his nephew Lot, right? And then after the battle, there, there were actually other, there were kings there that were allied uh, with Abraham and, and they were celebrating their victory in this, this valley uh, called the, the King's Valley, right? Well, one of these kings, his name was Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. Now, all right, uh, there are varying theories on this, but uh, the one that makes, makes most sense to me is that Melchizedek was the king of the area that we now call Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem wasn't always Jerusalem as we know it, okay? Uh, in fact, before King David conquered the city of Jerusalem, it was actually under control of the Canaanites, a whole different group of people. Right now, that's important because the the people of the ancient world um, would often name their kings after gods that they worshipped. Okay, so look at the name Melchizedek. We'll we'll put it up there on the screen for you. Uh, look at that name, Melchizedek. Let's break that in half. Uh, Mel the first half, Melchi Mel Mel Melchi. I don't know how to actually like pronounce that form since it's only half the word, but that uh, that M-E-L-C-H-I means king of. And Zedek means righteousness, as, as the writer of Hebrews says. But Zedek is also, at the same time, the name of a very prominent and main Canaanite god. I mean, this is, this is very well known in, in scholarship. Uh, Zedek was a Canaanite god that... Um, was worshipped during the time of Abraham in the city of Salem, which is really the pre-Israelite Jerusalem, okay? So the author of Hebrews, I mean, he's right. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. But at the same time, Melchizedek also means my king is Zedek. Well, that's interesting because even though Melchizedek was likely named after this Canaanite god, uh, Zedek, the scriptures actually affirm that Melchizedek worshipped Yahweh. Melchizedek served the one true God, Yahweh, the, the God most high. In fact, um, Melchizedek was a priest of Yahweh God. That's 
super important. I want to talk about priests for a couple minutes. I mean, in the minds of the original readers of this letter of Hebrews, priests of God only came from a certain people group uh, in in, uh, the nation of Israel. Okay? It goes all the way back to when God made a, made a threefold promise to Abraham. And the promise was that really Abraham would have descendants as numerous as the stars, uh, you know, among other things. And that, that meant that God, his promise would continually uh, go through Abraham's lineage, right? So Abraham had his son Isaac, and, and that in itself was a miracle. But Abraham had his son Isaac. Isaac had a son Jacob. And then Jacob wrestles with God, and then God renames Jacob as Israel, okay? And Israel went on to have 12 sons, and those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And we can see that in the the diagram there that Joey's putting up on the screen. And I want to point out that uh, there was a point in history, in Israel's history, where the 12 tribes actually split. There were 10 in the north, and then there were, t- uh, there were two in the south. The, the north was just uh, continued to call, be called the kingdom of Israel. And the south was the kingdom of Judah. Now, uh, one of the ten tribes in the kingdom of Israel were the Levites. Okay, Those were the people that were chosen to be the priests of Israel. The Levites, that one people group, that one tribe. They were the tribe of Levi. So the reason that the writer of Hebrews brings all of this up is because his readers uh, were thinking that for anyone to be a true priest of God, they needed to descend from the tribe of Levi. And the problem in their minds was that Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah. So how could he be a real priest? I mean, he's not from Levi. Well, the writer is saying, Look at Melchizedek. Melchizedek was was a priest, and he was around long before the Levites. And Melchizedek wasn't he, he wasn't a priest just because of his family line. Okay? Uh, look at verses 14 to 17. I'm, I'm going to read that for you. It says, For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, there's that. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, here it is, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry. In other words, uh, you know, another priest appears not because of his family line, but he appears on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. In other words, God's the one that decides that this person is a priest. Okay. Uh, For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Look, the writer of Hebrews is telling his readers that Jesus is our legitimate high priest because he ordained himself with an oath, and he can do that because he is God. Okay? doesn't matter what lineage Jesus even came from. God declared it, and that's that. Argument over. So, you know, that's what it means when the text says that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest in the same way that Melchizedek was made a priest. And their their priesthood was ordained by God and not man. But the difference between the two of them is that, you know, Jesus is able to be our high priest forever. Melchizedek couldn't do that. He had to die at some point. But uh, Jesus could be our high priest forever. You know, and, and I know some of you might even be thinking, so what? Uh, so what? Isn't this all just a bunch of Bible history? What does that even matter? Uh, how does any of this matter to us today? Well, it does. Let's check out verses 18 to 25. I'm going to read those too. It says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Well, what's it talking about? Oh, it's talking about the law. Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. Those Old Testament laws, the law made nothing perfect. And 
a better hope was introduced, is introduced, by which we draw near to God. This better hope that was introduced, we draw near to God through it. And it was, it was not without an oath. That was important because uh, others became priests without any oath. Uh, they became priests because of their family line, the, the Levites. But he, Jesus, became a priest with an oath when God said to him, and this is a quote from Psalm 110 verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. God himself ordained himself. So verse 22, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant, a better promise. That's what the word covenant means. Uh, Covenant, promise, testament, they all mean the same thing. It's a promise, God's promises, right? Old Testament, New Testament, old promise, new promise, but God's promises uh, continue on. So verse 23, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, verse 25, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Now here's the thing. God made a threefold promise to Abraham, but that's not the only promise God ever made. God made, you know, several promises throughout the Old Testament. Uh, But there's now an even better promise, and it's through Jesus. We have this promise. You and I have it. It's a better promise because during the time of the Israelites, God set up a, a priesthood system through the tribe of Levi. But none of those priests were exempt from death. None of them could be priests forever. But Jesus, on the other hand, conquered death. And because he lives forever, he is now our permanent high priest. He's our go-between, between between us and God. Check out verse 25 again. Uh, Therefore, he, meaning Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him because... He always lives to intercede for them. Highlight this verse, underline this verse, commit this verse to memory. Because this, in my opinion, is the main verse of the passage. It's the key verse, okay? And there are three things in this verse that I really want uh, you to uh, take away from uh, before we end the sermon today. The first thing is, number one, point number one, is that Jesus is able to save completely. Jesus is able to save completely. All right, well, what are people being saved from? Are people being saved from themselves? Are people being saved from this world and all of its chaos? I mean, especially now, right? Are, are, are they being saved from this evil guy in this red spandex suit and a, and a pitchfork? No, 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 no. No, no, no. People are being saved from the wrath of God. They're being saved from God himself. That thought might actually make us a little uncomfortable. But I want you to notice that this has been God's plan all along. Okay? God is the one that ordained the priesthood. God is the one who came down for us himself, who who sacrificed himself for us so that we could come back to him. From from page one of this Bible to the end uh, proves to me that God throughout all of history has been doing nothing but pursuing his people. He's pursuing you. He's pursuing me. Question is, are we going to reject him or not? People are being saved from the wrath of God. All this goes back to the gospel, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I want to explain this uh, in a little bit of a different way. Uh, You may have heard this before if you've watched the second American uh, 
uh, gospel documentary, which if you haven't, I highly recommend it. But um, they uh, they explained it this way. I mean, first of all, we're all sinners who cannot stand before a perfectly holy God. Okay, but what does that actually mean? I don't know that we always understand the gravity of our situation. I've said several times now, you know, ever since I started as lead pastor, you and I are in a desperate state. But do we realize the level of desperation? Well, uh, this illustration really uh, just helped me think about it. You know, um, I'm tweaking it a little bit, but just imagine, you know, I can imagine uh, my son being over uh, at a neighbor's house and, and uh, they're playing with a, a remote control car and, and uh, maybe, maybe he gets mad for some reason at, at, at the neighbor and he takes a key and scratches the remote control car, right? Well, if he comes home, uh, you better believe that if I find out what he did, he's going to be in trouble, right? He's going to be, uh, we ain't going to let that one go, right? That's, that's just not a nice thing to do. It's not how you treat other people. Well, what if he, uh, instead of scratching the remote control car, he took his key and drew a line, uh, dug it into the into the uh, Honda Civic in the driveway, and drew a line from the start to the from the front to the back of the car? Wow, um, that would be really bad, um, especially if he's an adult, because now he may be facing uh, criminal charges because that's an that's a criminal act, right? That's no longer just a childish act like against the remote control uh, car. It's, it's a criminal act. Why? Well, because the car is worth a lot more than that remote control car. The Civic is worth a lot more than the, the remote control car. But, um, you know, what if, what if Alex, uh, sorry, I'm picking on you, Alex. It just kind of happened. But, you know, I know he would never do this. But what if, what if um, we, have a, we, have, we had a Tesla the other day on our street. Uh, I have never seen it there before. They must have been visiting. What if he went down the street, took his key, and and just keyed that Tesla car? Well, the Tesla car is worth a lot more than the Honda Civic. So now, the, all of a sudden, the consequences are even more because the car itself is worth more. What what if Alex, you know, keyed a you know a brand new 2020 Lamborghini again? It's worth far more. Uh, so the more something is worth that that we uh, go up against and kind of, uh, you know, destroy, the worse our consequences. But the problem here, that the thing here is that God is worth far more than any of that. Uh, he is uh, worth an infinite, uh, like his worth is infinite. Okay, so when we sin against God, it's not even like scratching a Lamborghini, because at least there we might somehow have a hope of paying off that. Uh, but if we sin against God, who is has infinite worth, that we have no hope of repaying that. We can't. We we could die. Maybe we could sacrifice ourselves, right? But even that act isn't enough. Because you and I aren't infinite. God is infinite, right? So only God would really be able to um, pay the penalty of, uh, you know, our sins against him because he himself is infinite. I mean, you know, the, the, the truth here is you and I, uh, we sin against a perfectly holy God. We, we do. It's in our nature. Our, our sinfulness really is a direct result of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. But even more than that, it's, it's worse than that. Because we're not the only ones who rebelled against God. I mean, there are evil spiritual forces of wickedness out there who rebelled against God. We see that in the early chapters of Genesis. We talked about that in our first series uh, that went through January and February this year. You know, these these evil spiritual forces of wickedness, uh, they're the ones that want to pull us away from God. They're the storm that tosses us about, you know, on, on the turbulent waters, okay? God is our anchor. Jesus is our anchor that keeps us 
straight, on the straight and narrow. He keeps us steadfast. Okay? The truth is, all of us are born into a losing battle. And I say that because without Jesus, we cannot achieve victory. And by victory, I mean salvation. I mean an eternal life with God. We can't have victory through our own performance in this life because none of us are perfect. That that is a milk thing that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. We cannot have victory through our own performance. We cannot even pay the penalty that God requires of us uh, because of our sin. But rather than you and I taking on the penalty that we deserve, Jesus took it on himself for us. That's the gospel. That's the gospel message. It's about the fact that only a perfectly holy God could fully repay the penalty that our perfectly holy God requires. Jesus was the only one who could do this. He's the only one who is able to save completely because he is God. He is God. So that brings me to point number two from verse 25. Jesus only saves those who come to God through him. That's the definition of a real believer. Someone who actually believes in Jesus is someone who continually comes to God through him. This is someone who continually draws near to God, as as verse 19 says in chapter 7. Actually, uh, why don't you scroll up and, and look at verse 19. Look at that phrase, draw near to God. The Greek behind that phrase is in a tense that indicates present, continuous action. In other words, drawing near to God isn't a one-time thing that just happened in the past that we can like we can put a date on it and a, like a time stamp. Boom, there it is. That's that's not it. You know, ha- have you ever heard the idea that if, if someone uh, said a prayer in the past to accept Jesus into their life, then they're just good forever. They're they're good to go forever, as as if it doesn't matter if they end up losing their faith or not, like Josh. Josh Harris, if you've heard that, I need you to know that is not what the Bible teaches. It's not biblical. I want you to listen to what Pastor John Piper has to say about it. He says, I love this quote. He says, if we do not go on drawing near to God, we have no warrant for thinking that we are being saved by the Lord Jesus. Let me let me say that again. Look, If we do not go on drawing near to God, there's that continual action. If we do not continue to be believers who believe, then we have no warrant for thinking that we are being saved in the end by the Lord Jesus. Saved from God's wrath. You know, we've been saying this a lot in our study of Hebrews A real believer is one who keeps on being a believer. They remain loyal to Jesus. If at any point they reject Jesus, then they're rejecting the gift of salvation. And that leads me to point number three from verse 25. If we go back down there. Point number three is this. Jesus is always praying for us. He's praying for his followers, his believers. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's what it means that Jesus is interceding for us. To to intercede for means he's praying for us on our behalf. That's really important. Praying for the people was actually uh, one of the jobs of of a priest, including a high priest. But Jesus is able to pray for us continually because he lives forever. His prayer for us never ceases. He prays continually. Paul gets at this in Romans 8.34, which 
basically says that uh, Jesus is at the right hand of God, the Father, and he is interceding for us. He is praying for us. And you know what? You know, for me, honestly, this is probably the most important point of today's passage. Just knowing that Jesus is continually praying for me. I mean, that's just hard to even describe how, how I even feel about that, to be honest, um, because I'm overwhelmed with that. I'm overwhelmed with the idea that the God who created all things, the God who holds all things together, the God who came down to this earth for me to live a perfect life, to die for me, to take on my sins, you know, that, that same God uh, who provided a path for me to him is continually praying for me. He's continually praying for those who continually draw near to him. As one scholar I read puts it, our eternal security as believers is established beyond question. There is no doubt. If we are drawing near to God throughout our lives, then we have no reason to worry that we could ever lose our gift of salvation. Okay? We, we can be worry-free of that if we're drawing near to God. So, you know, this sermon series, this entire sermon series is called Why Jesus? Why Jesus? Well, it's because he's the only one who is able to provide a way, to provide a path for people to be made right with God. As the writer of Hebrews says, I mean, check out starting at verse 26. He says, such a high priest truly meets our need. Jesus truly meets our need. Jesus, one, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners because he, he had no sin. He didn't sin. Exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the other people. He doesn't need to do that. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. This is why we need to choose to put our faith in Jesus. This is why Jesus, this is why we need to choose Jesus, because he is able to save those who, who continually draw near to him. And when we draw near to him, he continually prays for us on our behalf. And I just want to conclude with uh, Pastor John Piper's words here. He says, Is it not a wonderful thing to know that God bids us come, that this great, holy God of righteousness and wrath says, draw near to me through my son, your high priest. Draw near to me. Draw near to me. This is God's closing invitation this morning. His word is saying, draw near to me through your high priest. Draw near to me in, in confession. Draw near to me in prayer. Draw near to me as you meditate on my word, filling your minds with my word. Draw near to me in trust and in joyous praise because we do have victory through Jesus. He is saying, come, I will not cast you out. When we believe, we have a certainty of the promise of God that we will be with him forever. That is our eternal security, our salvation. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning just humbled by your word, humbled by the, the truths that are just leaping off the page here. God, thank you so much that, that we can be certain of What's going to happen to us once we pass away someday? More than that, we can be certain that uh, we 
have a relationship with you. Thank you so much for, uh, for loving us. I mean, it even for me personally, uh, it just sounds trivial to even just say thank you. I don't know how to thank you enough. None of us do. It's just so humbling to think about how much you've, you actually love us. God, I pray that we would only ever just continue to learn to love you even more in our lives and in, in everything we do. God, I pray for, for Refton Church, uh, those of us who are watching uh, this sermon online, um, and those of us who couldn't make it for whatever reason, I pray for all of us uh, that we would find a joyous, hope-filled certainty uh, that we can stand on um, in our faith in you, that we wouldn't waver, that we wouldn't be tossed side to side uh, from what the world has to offer, that we wouldn't be led astray from you. I pray that you would anchor us in our faith, especially in light of everything that's happening today. God, I pray for our nation. I pray for all the unrest and the just the awful things that are happening. The unthinkable things, the 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 idea that another human being is is less valuable than another. I mean, we know your word says that you show no favoritism. We are all on the same playing field. And God, I pray that you would use your church to communicate that message, the gospel message, to those who desperately need it, which we know is all of us. God, I pray for not only our nation, but the rest of the nations around the world. Because your word says that we need to spread your message to every nation, all peoples. I pray that that would happen, that would continue to happen. I pray that you would use us in unique and interesting ways. Uh, God, I pray that you would even use this online format to capture uh, people to be brought into your family, uh, that they just happen to stumble upon um, these messages. God, uh, again, um, you know, we're just so humbled by your word that continues to teach us how to live for you. May we continue to have the strength every day to live for you. There are some in our congregation that I know uh, need your strength daily just to get through the day. God, uh, they're not alone. I mean, there are others of us that have been through that. And I pray uh, that we as a church would be able to build each other up even in these times of isolation. I pray that you would use us to build each other up um, and to encourage each other uh, so that we can remain steadfast in our faith, in our mission to connect people to Jesus. So God, as, as we um, are about to uh, discuss what was talked about in this sermon, I pray that uh, you would bless that time with families and, and even individuals who are just uh, doing their own personal Bible study. I pray that you would bless them as they really look into your word and really uh, think about these questions about, you know, about their faith and uh, in light of their own life. Pray that you would bless our children as well as they are learning about you, learning what it means uh, to believe in Jesus, in you. Thank you uh, for our children um, and just their example of, of faith. And uh, I pray that, yeah, that, that we would all continue to be built up. So God, we come to you this morning 
we approach you, your throne room, uh, in confidence, in boldness, just to say thank you and to, and to just, you know, get on our knees, um, whether physically or symbolically, get on our knees and really just give our lives over to you continually as we continually seek you, as we continually draw near to you. And we pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stain the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I though vile as he Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more. some church of God be saved to sin no more ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wound supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die when this poor Lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. Then, in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing. sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save
So as per usual, we have our discussion questions that you can consider and think about and talk about with those around you in light of Scott's sermon from today. So kids, you're up first. Here's some questions for you. And parents, I just want to encourage you to please help your children with these questions. They're meant to engage all of you in conversation about biblical truths we get to hear from every Sunday. So kids, you're up first. Why do you think kids get in trouble with their parents when kids do something wrong? If parents need to punish their children, do you think they still love their children? Why or why not? If we believe in Jesus but we do something wrong, do you think God still loves you? Why or why not? And how did you do on your word finder? Here's what we got. How did you do? All right, here are some questions for everyone else. What did you think about Scott's point that people are being saved from the wrath of God? What's worse, God's wrath or our sin? And how can God be both wrathful and loving? What did you think about the fact that Jesus is always praying for those who are drawing near to him? Well, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We hope to see you soon. Take care.